Hello, Mary. Hello. It's nice Hello. to meet everyone virtually. Yes, yeah, very nice meeting you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm so excited for the session today. And do you mind to let our audience know where are you talking from right now? Yes, I'm actually in my hometown of New Orleans, Louisiana right now in the wow. US. So it's 12 hours different, right? Yes, so it's eight at night here. Okay, right so we see. thank you so much for accepting our invitation to share your results from your research in Cambodia. I know that you came to Cambodia to collect all the data for your research, but I'm wondering when was your first time coming to Cambodia? Actually, the first time I came was in 2010 when I was an undergraduate student. I came with a class to Cambodia. And then after that, I came back in 2012 to work as a research intern at Social Services of Cambodia. And that is sort of how I became interested in development work in Cambodia. Wow, that's, that's really like a, a long journey, right? So, and what really the reason behind that really inspired you to come back to Cambodia to do the research and specifically in uh, women health programming? Yeah, it is similar. So when I was working at SSC, I, we, they were doing programs around domestic violence and I was very interested in the sort of diverse donors and foundations that they had to report to. So I came back to Cambodia to study the differences between donors. Okay, I see. So yeah, I, I think that I would really keep asking so many questions like before you're presenting. So I will <laughs> not take much of your time right now. So I will give the floor to you to do the first session of the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I am sharing my screen. I hope you can all see it. Um, so thank you very, very much for coming to my talk today. I was supposed to come back to Phnom Penh in the spring to give my talk, but unfortunately COVID-19 prevented me from doing so. So I appreciate you all being here today virtually. And my research is about NGOs from the US and Japan implementing women's health programs in Cambodia. Um, and the sort of different understandings coming from the US and Japan about how to improve women's health, way to do that. So first, just to give you a short overview, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on my research project and an overview of my methods for the whole dissertation project. And then we will take the short break. Um, after that, I will present my findings from one chapter on the variation in program content and implementation, specifically looking at some of the differences in how um, practitioners talk about gender. So as I already told you a little bit, I became originally interested in the topic and Cambodia and development when I was um, just an intern at SSC many years ago now. Um, after that, uh, a while after that, I went to pursue my master's and PhD in a combined program. And in 2016, I was able to return to conduct my master's research in Cambodia, analyzing women's empowerment programs in NGOs that are funded by the US, South Korea, the UK, and Scandinavia. And I wanted to see which donors were more likely to fund what types of projects and also how local workers in Cambodia sort of made sense of the demands. And it was actually the study of South Korean NGOs that made me interested in Japan in the first place, um, because a lot of South Korean NGO workers told me that um, some of their work is based on the Japanese model. So after that, I came back in the summer of 2017 to collect preliminary data on Japanese NGOs and that's sort of how I became interested in, decided to study Japan versus the US. So I will start by introducing my larger dissertation project and then I will spend most of the talk telling you my results on just one topic. Um, my dissertation project began with a puzzle. So despite a shared aim of improving women's health, international NGOs from the US and Japan implement different programs in Cambodia. Um, Japanese NGOs with funding from JICA 
focused almost solely on strengthening government provided maternal health services in Cambodia. Um, there's no real discussion of reproductive health. They don't support local NGOs um, or private clinics. Contrastingly, US organizations promote both maternal and reproductive health care often together. Um, they do work with the public health sector increasingly, but they also work with private providers, local NGOs, and grassroots groups. So I went into the, to Cambodia to sort of ask three things that are on the slide. Um, how do women's health programs vary? So different types of programs that are implemented on the ground and the different ways that they talk about gender when implementing these programs is what I'll be talking about today. And the second question is how do relationships with partner organizations like local NGOs or the state vary? Um, and then the third question is different. I, how do different ideas about what development um, is in interactions with headquarters and donors shape the way Khmer practitioners think about their work um, and think about gender. So here I will only very, very briefly and super broadly discuss how I am talking about academic literature because I think many people are from NGOs and are more interested in the findings. Um, but I'm happy to take questions about this in the Q&A. But very generally, a lot of scholars document the dispersal of global program ideals like women's rights, universal health care, um, and environmentalism, similar to the sustainable development goals pictured here on the slide. Um, and they say, oh, these norms are taken up in international organizations and NGO programming. And then they look at how these programs are implemented and used and sometimes modified in recipient contexts like Cambodia. But my project is saying that scholars assume what NGOs are promoting is very similar, but we need to investigate national variation in donors and headquarter visions and how this impacts what projects are possible on the ground. Um, so basically I want to know how program ideas are changed in the donor nation before they travel to Cambodia and then how those different types of programs impact Cambodia. Um, so very, very briefly, I will tell you why Cambodia, but I am certain that you all know all of this information and even more than me. Um, but I chose Cambodia for my research other than because it is an amazing country. It is a great place to study NGOs and foreign aid. Um, as you all know, in the early 1990s, the UN assisted with the transition to democracy, and at this time, a huge number of foreign donors, including the US and Japan, came to the country, um, as well as numerous international and local NGOs coming or popping up. And Cambodian practitioners have a long history of dealing with international donors. Um, now there are not as many NGOs as there were then. Funding is changing, particularly it is decreasing from the US and Europe since Cambodia became a middle income country. And there are also laws restricting some NGOs like the Lango. Um, but still in 2016, the Asia Development Bank estimated there might be almost 2000 NGOs in the country with donors from at least 20 different nations. And also East Asian nations, particularly Japan and South Korea are increasingly looking to um, do foreign aid in Cambodia, including aid through NGOs. Um, and all of this makes Cambodia a very interesting place to study the differences between US and Japanese NGO programs. Okay, so to do my study, to study this, I conducted a comparative study of aid chains um, and as you know, NGOs work in what scholars call aid chains, but this is really just the connection between donors, international NGOs, and local NGOs. Um, so what I wanted to do was just talk with every single one of the organization in the aid chain to get a sense of how development works at every level. So in the US case, in the US aid chain, I started by interviewing and talking um, with USAID as you can see on the slide here, this is the US aid chain, it's a simplified model. Um, so in DC, I interviewed USAID employees about what 
type of health and gender programs they fund, why their um, system and their gender equality and women's empowerment policy. And then I interviewed NGO headquarters in DC to try to understand how they manage both programs and country offices all over the world and donors. Um, and then after that, I did um, four months of observation in an NGO country office in Phnom Penh. And then after that, I observed in their local NGO implementing partner. So I actually did the same for Japan. Um, so I started uh, interviewing at JICA and MOPA in Tokyo. I spent time at the NGO headquarters in Tokyo. And then I went to the NGO country office and we, they have an office. Um, we spent most of our time in Privy here and they implement, they do not fund local NGOs. So they implement in partnership with the provincial health department. Um, and when I asked JICA officials why they don't fund local NGOs, um, they often explain the reason is that you want to see the face of Japan that they want Japanese practitioners on the ground with their programming. Um, Japanese NGOs uh, implement either entirely on their own, they implement their own programs, or they do so with government partners. Um, and although all, in, all NGOs require MOUs from the government, you know this, and many cooperate with the government, Japanese organizations are very streamlined in their work focusing on the public healthcare system. And one other important difference is that US NGOs work in much more complicated aid chains. So um, the US NGO that I studied actually had two different uh, international NGO partners and then they subgranted to multiple local NGOs, whereas Japanese NGOs are relatively smaller. So in the end, I completed 10 months of ethnographic observation and 120 interviews with NGOs in Cambodia, Tokyo, and DC, because I wanted to get a more general understanding of NGOs working in the health and gender sectors. And I'm also working on a network analysis component, but that is not completed yet. So I will actually stop briefly in order to, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that, sorry. Let you ask some questions, if there are any. So if uh, any our of participant has any question, you can also send the question into the chat or you can use the raise hand function as indicated in the slide presentation. You look at the bottom of your, your bars and then you will see chat and then you click and then you, you will see that. Yeah. Uh, as we do not, we do not receive any question from our audience. So I will please allow me to go ahead with my question. Uh, because I saw that you you have really uh, interview a lot of organization travel like from Cambodia to Tokyo and also DC. Could you tell us a little bit like what were the challenges of doing this kind of research for you? Oh, um, yeah, there were several challenges. Um, it was a lot of travel um, and also figuring out and fitting into each organizational culture. I felt like I could never know enough about each organization and it was difficult to leave and stop each time. Um, I wanted to go back and COVID-19 didn't let me do that. So that was quite a challenge as well. And then finally, um, living in Prairie here, I had to improve my Khmer much more quickly and I took classes in the US, but taking classes is not the same. That's really needing to use it. Exactly, yeah. So there were many challenges. But when you start like doing, because I know the best uh, be get received the permission from one organization to allow you to best in one organization and observe their work. Is it challenging to get a permission from that organization or not? For that purpose? Hmm. Yes, sometimes challenging. Um, 
I had to ask sometimes multiple organizations, but sometimes organizations felt like it was a trade because I was willing to help them with reporting or anything that they needed in order to come and learn more about their work. Okay, so we received one question from uh, Mr. So Mr. Armers. So Kim, uh, who asked the question, what are the outcome in terms of outreach and sustainable impact from the USAID and JICA? Because like, they have different chain, uh, different ed chain. Yeah, so um, that is actually answered uh, in the second part of the talk. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> so thank you for the question. I know that you start really feeling curious about that. And this will be addressed in the second session of the presentation. And because we, we will only have the Q&A for the session shot, but after the second presentation, we will have like 20 to 25 minutes that, so that with that time frame will allow us to ask so many questions to our presenter. So for the next, uh, we have one question to our audience. It's a yes and no question. And our team will have to put like uh, the poll. So you, you have 30 seconds to post your answers, just yes and no. And the question is, have you ever met someone who worked for a Japanese NGO? So we, we got one response already. And sorry for those who are watching us on the Facebook Live that you cannot uh, join the poll. We waiting for four more respondents to join us and then we can conclude the result. Okay, so for the poll, we could see like 70% of the, our audience has never met anyone working from uh, for the Japanese NGO and only 27 that said yes to the question. So I would like to um, ask Marie to continue for the first session. So I, I'm sure that this question will really lead to the second presentation. Thank you. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. And thank you for answering this question. I was very curious because sometimes people say yes or no. So it's good to know. Okay. So as I said before, I'm really only going to focus on the different women's health programs here. I won't talk as much about my other chapters that are different about differences on state relationships or impacts on practitioners. Um, but I call the two NGOs in my study Health Services Asia or HSA, that's the Japanese NGO, and Global Family Aid or GFA, that's the US based NGO. Um, those are not their real names. I do this for privacy. So there's two important things that impacts women's health services um, in my research, the ideas about the best way to improve women's health, and second, who they select as partners to implement with is different. So first I will talk about HSA, that is the Japanese NGO. So after World War II, Japan very successfully created an effective uh, public health care system for mothers and newborns and drastically improved its own maternal mortality ratio rate. Um, and its public health system is more generally known to be one of the best in the world today. So donors and headquarter organizations in Tokyo really draw on this and they explain that they want to fund and conduct programs that directly promote the Japanese experience in maternal and child health in developing nations. Um, so you can see on the slide, this is an excerpt, excerpt from a JICA report. Um, and JICA has two funding schemes, one directly to developing country governments and a much smaller one that goes to Japanese organizations. Um, uh, NGOs are included in this as well as university groups and some other organizations to implement programs. And interviewees in Japan also explain that grassroots um, NGOs work on what they call uh, kusenone, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but or grassroots programs. Um, but they define grassroots programs as partnership with the local or provincial level government. 
So many Japanese donors have a firm belief in upgrading the public health system in developing countries like Cambodia, including the management and health skills of public health officials and the use of the maternal child health handbook that actually worked very well in Japan. So here on the slide is a picture of um, one Japanese version and also a Kamai version that JICA helped to support. So interviewees in Japan report that the above activities support uh, many sustainable development goals like universal health care. However, when asked any um, direct discussions or activities relating to gender equality or women's empowerment, like we almost always see in NGOs in the US, practitioners in Japan are very clear that Japanese programs do not do these things. Um, so one foundation interviewee, she states, yeah, I think it's maybe those types of programs are really kind of sensitive. I think it's a Japanese way of providing support to other countries to kind of make sure they don't step in too much. We don't want to intervene in other cultures, end quote. So due to these priorities in Cambodia, this translates to HSA implementing its programs in close cooperation with the Provincial Health Department in Previhia in order to provide health education and services to mothers. So this is in contrast to NGOs from Europe, the US and Australia, um, which while they do increasingly work in partnership with the Cambodian state on health projects, they also all support local NGOs. Um, even GIZ, which is Germany's bilateral agency, um, is often seen as the closest to Japan in its cooperation with the state. But even GIZ has a civil society promotion strategy that um, supports local NGOs. So staff at HSA explain um, their work in part as what they, they call um, helping um, mothers in Prebihir to be modern Asian mothers. So they draw on this regional rhetoric of Asia. And to do so, HSA's main office, um, they have one in Phnom Penh, but also we spend most of our time in um, the province Prebihir. And their organization is smaller than GFA. They only have 14 staff, two are Japanese, um, all reporting is done in Japanese and the rest are Khmer, and they focus on implementing one project with funding from JICA and some Japanese companies. So to support the public health system, HSA's main activities are implementing a training of the trainers model. So they work with the provincial health department doctors of nutrition and maternal child health. They train district health doctors in subjects like breastfeeding, maternal and newborn nutrition, pregnancy and cooking nutritious bonbon for babies. Um, and then provincial and health, uh, district health doctors and officials actually train the health center workers on the same topics. And then the health center workers actually train the village health support group volunteers. And then finally the village volunteers train groups of mothers um, in the village through health monitoring events where they talk about things like the use of the maternal child health handbook and the cooking trainings. And health center workers are paid and village volunteers are paid a per diem to attend most of these events in the villages. So to do this sort of close cooperation with the Cambodian state, uh, HSA's program managers are largely men and they have a background often in the health field, so they not necessarily have worked in development before at all. Um, and they spend an inordinate amount of time building positive relationships with provincial officials. And they spend very little time working with other NGOs, although they do have some more um, meetings with other Japanese NGOs. Um, so one day after I watch an HSA program manager coach a health center worker to provide a training to village health officials, I ask him why he never provides any of this health training himself and himself. And he states, uh, sorry, I have to move these heads. We empower state officials to do this themselves to implement their own policies, the quote on the slide. 
Um, and this is just a very different definition of empowerment than we see at GFA. So as a result of this HSA model, it does help to upgrade state official skills. It has a single goal, um, sustainability through the state implementing the public maternal health system in the future. Um, but it doesn't challenge gender norms the way that most NGOs from the West are required to do. Um, so they only train mothers and no there's no discussion of gender equality. Um, so I actually never once heard the term used the whole time I observed, which is very different from NGOs that are from the US, Europe, and Australia. Uh -oh. So now I will talk about the other side, um, the USA side. So first, USAID funds a much larger number of international and local NGOs than JICA. Um, it's estimated that at least 25% of its funding goes to NGOs. And it's also much more specific in its call for proposals. So Japanese NGOs design um, programs as they see fit. They have a lot more say, whereas um, most of the time USAID is very specific about what it wants to see. So unlike HSA's centralized programming, the US NGO headquarters have more numerous and diverse goals for programs to accomplish in recipient nations. Um, so programs need to improve women's health. They need to improve uh, women's empowerment and gender equality. They need to work with the private sector often. They need to promote uh, the public health sector as well. And they also need to support grassroots advocacy and local organizations. Um, so both headquarters and country office staff at GFA expressed that this can be an overwhelming number of things that they need to do. But when it comes to gender, interviewees at GFA's headquarter um, and donor informed me that any maternal health program must include a discussion of reproductive health and women's empowerment or gender equality. So this is sort of a big difference from HSA. And now I will quote one interviewee. Quote, so in every program that we run, we shouldn't be thinking about the way that gender inequities and gender roles are shaping people's access to, we should be thinking about the way gender inequities and gender roles are shaping people's access to an uptake of health services. We should be trying to, at the minimum, make sure we're not doing any harm by reinforcing gender norms. And really we should be challenging unequal gender norms in the home. So alongside gender, there's also an emphasis um, on the market. So there's things like the discussion of empowering women in family planning so that they can work outside the home or an emphasis on the private sector healthcare in developing nations, um, like this quote on the slide, where she says, we need to engage the supply side and the demand side to create and strengthen healthcare markets. Um, sorry. So this is something we simply just don't really see on the Japanese side because there's more of a focus when it comes to women's health on the state and sustainability through the state. Um, it also is interesting to me because it's very similar to the US's own healthcare system where we offer healthcare through a market with stopgap public and nonprofit services. Um, the final, oh, sorry, the final thing uh, that the US really emphasizes is m and &E, uh, monitoring and evaluation, as I'm sure you all know. Um, all donors emphasize measuring the effectiveness. JICA does have qualitative and quantitative follow-up measures. Um, but as others, a lot of other scholars have shown, um, the US above most donors is particularly stringent when it comes to measurement. So in Cambodia, to accomplish these multiple goals, GFA does work with private clinics to upgrade their services. It works with a government partner on the policy level. And then it also calls for proposals to subgrant to local NGOs, which implement their women's health programming. 
Um, GFA's country office does integrate activities that promote gender equality into its work, like conducting required gender analyses to integrate gender throughout the life of the program, staff and partner gender trainings, ME metrics for gender, and but unlike HSA, GFA staff do not personally implement any of their maternal health education activities directly. Instead, GFA worked with a local NGO to design and monitor women's health education activities. Um, so in order to know more about that, I then went into a, a Kampong Spear to observe a local NGO subgrantee, which I call Cambodian Development Society, CDS. Again, it is private, so that's not the real name. And at CDS, At CDS, um, there is a health team that implements maternal and reproductive health trainings. And while the team leader lives in the provincial town, health team members often come from the surrounding area where they are assigned to work and they get to know villagers well, and they are trained in effective health communication. So they conducted small and large group trainings providing maternal health information, such as healthcare visits, breastfeeding, and nutrition, as well as providing information on modern family planning. Um, so when I asked the health team leader, what is her purpose? She says, we increase women's ability to make their own health choices and advocate for themselves. So these team members offer small group trainings, um, often only with women in someone's home, but also sometimes facilitate larger events with both men and women to sort of facilitate discussion between couples. Um, but particularly in the small groups in women's home, um, the health team gets to know women, provides them with a very open space to ask questions and discuss women's choices and help them access health clinics, um, both public and private, but a lot of times private. Um, and women often ask questions like, does birth control make me gain weight? What if my mother says to give the baby sugar water? Um, if I use the IUD, can I never get pregnant again? And trainers sort of disperse myths and provide women with choices in a comfortable environment that sometimes wasn't possible because um, HSA staff and health clinic workers were, or health center workers were often male. So that was not always possible on the other side. So that made, made things more formal. But at CDS, health team members also face um, monitoring every quarter. And part of this is counting the number of women that they got to go to health clinics and uptake modern birth control methods. Um, so there's m and &E pressure to report that they've helped a certain number of women uptake. And when staff hadn't met their quotas yet, sometimes they just feel a lot of pressure to do it. Um, and that could lead them to be overly enthusiastic in trainings or provide information that wasn't necessarily grounded in medical science such as the withdrawal method negatively impacts your husband's health. So in contrast to HSA's strong focus on public health services, CDS staff are more likely to refer women to private clinics and do little to improve public health, but they do improve women's choices and they discuss gender equality. Um, still while facing issues with ME pressure. So we can see that there are strengths and difficulties um, within each program. But in conclusion, I'm, I have to note, the A-chain is not about a lack of um, ability to do anything or the idea that donors have all the power. Um, so at HSA, my practitioners do change programs to make them work better in Cambodia. They, ally with state officials to discuss traditional health, even though HSA as Japanese staff doesn't necessarily promote doing that. And they oft sometimes use relationships with officials to increase their own chances of career advancement. CDS staff sometimes ignore requirements to talk to both men and women when they thought it was best to help women get IUDs privately. So Khmer practitioners absolutely make decisions based on what they think will work best in Cambodia and adapt programs when they need to. Um, but for my research, the real sort of point is that when what they have the opportunity to do and adapt is very different based on uh, Japan and US development models. So in 
conclusion, often we assume gender and health programming is very similar, but I show here that there's sort of national variation in ways to do this. Yeah, so thank you very much for listening. And thank you to CKS for supporting my research. And I look forward to your comments and questions. I am still writing my dissertation and I am still hoping to come back to Cambodia when um, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the vaccine comes out. So I'm very happy to hear your feedback and thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so, for those who have the, the question to our presenter, please, uh, on if on Zoom, you can raise your hand and then we can turn on the mic or you can also listen directly to the chat. And for those who are watching the presentation live on Facebook, you can also leave your question in the comment and our team will bring up the question to our presenter. So before taking the question from our audience, I would please allow me to ask the first question to Marie that uh, why, why did you decide to compare the US and Japan specifically and why really uh, women health instead of other program? Um, so I decided to compare the US and Japan in part because I'm very interested in sort of the growing power of East Asia and Asia in the world, um, particularly South Korea, Japan and China, um, and what the rise of Asia in many ways means for foreign aid and development through NGOs. Um, and I picked Japan because it is the oldest donor. It came to Cambodia in the 1990s. Um, South Korea is a much newer donor and China does not fund NGOs. Um, and then I picked the US because it's a well-known established um, Western donor and also in some ways because it is, was pragmatic. I, um, I live in the US and so I was already traveling to Tokyo and traveling to Cambodia. So to pick the UK would make for a lot more travel. Um, and then for women's health, uh, it ended up, I was really interested in doing a project that was in the area of gender um, because my master's research was on women's empowerment and women's health is a huge priority area for both Japan and the US. So it's something they both have a lot of funding towards. So for the next question, I would like to invite Bong Suk Kim from CDLI to ask the question directly to our presenter. I will turn on the mute, on the mic. Hello, Bong. Hi, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so Kempe, uh, director from the CDI. Um, my, my, my question to you, Mary, uh, uh, as you see from the respondent just now about uh, if they have ever met the Japanese NGO, do you think that because they work through the government uh, make them more, less visible or because of their uh, branding issues? Uh, because normally uh, the Japanese uh, NGO that I know uh, have to display JICA and Japanese flag very visibly. And, and may also this may lead to the confusion that if they are NGO or they are the Japanese government. But what's your thinking on that, Mary? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. It's a very good question. I'm not sure I fully know the answer um, because I am very interested sometimes I ask a lot of people in American or European NGOs, if they know Japanese NGOs and they say, no, they've never met anyone from them. Um, I think that you are probably right, but at the same time, American NGOs have to display USAID or USAID on logos a lot on their work. Um, but I think you're right. It may be a sort of branding issue often because they work in close cooperation with the government, um, like at HSA they, the provincial director of the health department, they worked with him to share their baseline data. And then they had a conference where the provincial health department was talking about the baseline data as if it was theirs. So I think you're right that they don't brand things in the same way. So yeah, that would be my response. Thank you. 
also, uh, Mary, I uh, convey one question from our audience on Facebook Live, Jessica Gappers, who also our CKS uh, fellow as well. So, we met before. Uh, we took a night class <laughs> together. Hi, Jessica. <laughs> okay, so her question is, uh, but do you do you think Japan and US are representative of other national ed program or is this more diverse? Mm. This is also a very good question. Um, so for Japan, I have studied South Korean NGOs some, so I know the answer a bit. South Korea is in a funny place where their NGOs both want to copy some things that are done by maybe Western US and European NGOs, and they also want to follow the lead of Japan. Um, so they, Koika had a local NGO funding for a couple of years and then they stopped it and they said, oh, we wanna follow the model of Japan. We're gonna do what JICA does instead and not fund local NGOs, but fund Korean NGOs. Um, so I think Japan in terms of NGOs is sort of a role model because it's been a longer donor. Um, but also something that South Korea is like exploring different options. Um, and then China is its own. It's doing something entirely different. So I can't really speak to that. Um, but in terms of the US, the US is a very powerful donor. It gives a huge, huge amount of money all over the world. Um, but I think that Scandinavian and donors from the EU are actually more um, likely, I found in interviews to promote grassroots mobilizations and social movements. So I think that the US um, is definitely different from those donors. Uh, also, like, thank you for the clarification to all the questions from Odie and also from me. I have another question because I, at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned about the increase of the presence of Japanese and also the South, South Korean South Korean government in supporting to the program in Cambodia. Because like in the several uh, several several years ago that CK, uh, Cambodia has changed to least middle income country, so a lot of international donor has moved out of the country. But do you see the reason why these two donor become the one that more interested in supporting more program in Cambodia? That's a very good question as well. Um, when I talk to both donors, they don't necessarily say that aid is going up, but they say it will definitely stay the same in the bilateral agencies. Um, and honestly, I think that it is because, well, Japan certainly has a history of funding Southeast Asia. It's its priority in terms of foreign aid. Um, and then I also think it is because of competition with China for influence in the region. Uh, as we haven't received any more questions from our participants, so I'm still having more questions to you, Mary. I hope that all the participants will not mind, but please feel free to leave your question in the chat or even like use the rest hand function in on the Zoom so that I can convey your question, what you're really curious about this presentation. Yeah, so for the, the second question that uh, you talk about, you talk about the advocacy in the beginning, but it doesn't seem like either this NGO are engaging in, in it at all. So I'm wondering what does really advocacy mean here and what, what is its role in your study as well? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. So as I was saying a little bit before in my master's research, um, it is mm -hmm. actually Scandinavian and EU donors that I find are more engaged with mobilization and sort of social movement building type advocacy, both in reproductive health and more generally. Um, mm -hmm. And as you know, this can sometimes be more difficult in Cambodia. Um, mm -hmm. But both uh, NGOs in my study saw themselves as engaging in advocacy, but not in that sort of traditional definition. So um, the Japanese case, the HSA said, um, the practitioners say that they engage in soft advocacy and they go to a lot of um, district and commune meetings and they 
try, they learn all about the budget and then they try to convince them, oh, you should fund healthcare. Perhaps you should consider health education activities um, mm. and try to show them about the budgets and how they could fund healthcare with that budget. So they consider that soft advocacy. And on the US side, um, they consider funding local NGOs to help women advocate for their own health choices is their way of doing advocacy. So it is not necessarily the traditional definition, but they did both think that they were doing it in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, within the program, Aldona, um, have you found that, it, do they have any kind of like modality or sustainability in order to make sure that even after the funding from their donor completed, but the program and the organization still run on its own? Um, yes. So I think that that's part of what's really interesting um, is the, for HSA, for the Japanese model, the state uh, improving the health officials skills is what's going to make the program sustainable. So in their ideal world, the um, health officials will implement all of the health education activities themselves when HSA leaves. Um, and on the other side for GFA, I think sustainability is more complicated because they are doing more, many different things. Um, so they think that they can help support the public health system some a little bit, but they also think that they're creating private healthcare markets. And so by helping women demand um, health services from private clinics, they're creating consumers. And then by upgrading the skills of the private clinics, they're um, supporting the supply side as well. And so I think that they see sustainability as something that will happen through the market instead. Thank you. Uh, we received some more question from uh, Bong So came again. I think that I, it is, would be easier for him to ask the question directly. So Bong, we, I would like to invite you to ask the question again directly to Mari. And thank you because like, those questions are really interesting. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I just want you to uh, specify a little bit the, the plus and minus of US. USAID and JICA NGO aid chains uh, that I asked earlier. And I, I just want uh, for, for the sake of the other NGO that want to operate in Cambodia, uh, which one they would prefer, you know, what you need to avoid, what you need to adapt and use uh, to make it successful uh, operation in Cambodia, maybe other country like Laos, Myanmar or, or, or Vietnam. I, I think that uh, the question is clear to you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much again for your question. Um, this is a difficult question and one that I am still working through. By the time I finish writing my project, I want to be able to have a written <laughs> answer to your question. Um, but I think that both projects have positives and negatives. Um, so on the side of HSA, they do work very hard to upgrade the state official skills and provide them with um, better use of health information. Um, I think that there, I have some questions and the Khmer staff also had this question about whether it will continue or not when they leave if there is no more per diem. Um, but they did, I mean, the state officials were doing all of the training so that they knew the information. So their skills were upgraded in that way. Um, I think the other difficult thing about the Japanese case, um, this is maybe my opinion because I am a Westerner, but they don't necessarily talk about gender. And so sometimes that's going to leave, um, that's that, I mean, that might be difficult in terms of assuming that mothers will take care of the child um, and do this nutritious cooking, but maybe the father doesn't want to pay for the nutritious food. And so if you don't train him as well, that can be a difficult thing. Um, and then I think on the US side, uh, there is not, I mean, even when they have this, they do try to work 
with the Cambodian state, but they do not pay per diems because USAID refuses and they have a, a little bit of trouble working successfully with the Cambodian state. So they're not really improving public health services in the same way, um, but they do do a really good job of providing women with information, of health information in a space where they can ask questions. And then those health team members actually follow up with those women and they know them really well. So I think that that is a positive. They do talk about gender and they train men and women. So men can have this information too. And they do a good job of opening the space so women can ask questions. Um, but they also, and I think that in headquarters and in the country office, they knew this, but it's difficult to change m &E structures. But they also had this difficulty with m &E where they had just numbers of women they needed to get birth control by a certain time. And that is a lot of pressure for the staff. Thank you, Marie. Uh, we received one more question from our audience on Zoom, who asked like, do you see if the ideology shape how the way it is implemented? Uh, yeah, can I ask um, what you mean by ideology? Uh, but uh, I think uh, let uh, we let allow the our audience to ask directly whose uh, ID. I, I don't see the name, but just only the ID on his is like Oppo A19. Could you please turn on the mic? Passy. Yeah. Uh, Passy, because I, I don't see the name. <laughs> so uh, do you yeah. want to ask a question directly to our uh, presenter? <laughs> hi, Maria. Uh, Ideology, I mean like neoliberalism or others, you know, like if you see a different way between or a clear trend between uh, how the US implemented aid and the Japanese implemented aid because it influenced by different ideology or there is no difference. Yes. Um, so neoliberalism is something that um, scholars talk about a lot with NGOs, so it's a really good question. Um, I mean, the US, I would definitely say neoliberalism impacts their work. There's very much a focus on, oh, reproductive health will help women be better in the job market. There's also a focus on healthcare as a market. Um, so I would say neoliberalism as a perspective is very much there on the US side. Um, I think that that's part of what's really interesting about the Japanese case is um, that in many ways, Japan has this very strong developmental state that did create very strong public services and isn't um, sort of using the neoliberal perspective quite in the same way. So them seeing the sustainability um, will come from this public health providing these services and not the market is something I see as sort of challenging the neoliberal ideology. But of course, um, Japan does have a lot of social enterprise projects and does participate in that ideology in different ways. But it's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh... I, as I did not receive more questions from audience, but I still have a few more questions that would like to, to have you to address is like, which nation development mode is more effective from your, from your research? You um, yeah, this is something that is difficult because I think um, I answered it some, somewhat in the previous question, but uh, in some ways, what is more effective is determined by what the sort of donor nation actually thinks will work as a program. So it is difficult to compare those in other ways. But as I was saying before, um, I think that the Japanese case is more effective in actually providing, upgrading the skills of state officials. Um, but I think they have some difficulties in providing open trainings for women. Um, and also they don't talk about gender equality. Uh, I think the US case does not upgrade the services of the state, but they do do a better job in sort of providing open spaces where health education is more likely to be acted on in some ways. 
Yeah, I think it's a bit difficult to measure, right? Like which one is gonna be more effective in because like it depends on like how their program is designed and how they really implement it in real life. Yeah, so and also like I have another question that you did say about the USNGO and GFA partner with the Cambodian Step for Aid Health project. Can you talk more about the relationship and how it compared to HSAs? Yeah, so GFA does work with a sub, a health sub agency. Um, and with that sub agency, they um, want to help the sub agency create a system for regulating health education in Cambodia. Um, so they imagine that the sub agency would become the regulator of nonprofit, um, private, and public health services that try to prov provide this maternal health education. Um, and that is perhaps an effective idea, but it is just really interesting to me that it's very different from HSA's model where they think of the state as the Cambodian public health system will implement maternal health education and they don't think of anyone else. Whereas for the US case, they're actually helping the state regulate private and nonprofit actors as well as public health centers in this area. And so they very much like the US, think of the state as acting with other health actors in a market and nonprofits. So it's sort of, you can see the legacy of both countries in the way that they understand the role of the Cambodian state. Thank you. Uh, let me check whether we still have we still have time, and if all of the participants want to ask more questions, uh, if you are watching on Facebook Live, you can leave the question in the comment, and if you are on Zoom, you can leave you can send the question directly to us. So I am pleased to inform you that at the end of this. Uh, the session, we will have a short survey just to get the feedback from you so that we will, uh, it will be just like a poll that you just click yes and no. So it will take just like one minute for all your time to complete the survey. And that survey will be really helpful for us for the future, even organizing that we know what to improve and how at what time that going to be fit most of the audience bearers. So if we do not receive any more questions, I think we can conclude the session of the presentation of Mary today. And yeah, before ending the, the session, I would like to thank you to Mary for spending your time. I know that it's already late evening in the US. And thank you for the CKS team who have at the backstage helping with all the technical issues like Sunhee and Anika as well. And Thank you for all audience who stay with us until the end and posting a lot of interesting questions that really help to dig out, dig out deeper into the presentation of Mary. And I am sure that from the question, it would be really great also for Mary for the future research as well, like what, what else can be really dig down a little bit further for related to this topic as well. And I just received one question. So maybe before ending, we, we take this question as the last one. Like between USAID and JICA app, do you think which one is more powerful relating to gender empowering? Which is really a good question related to gender. Yeah, thank you for that final question. Um, I think that HSA does a good job. The Japanese case does a good job in improving the public services that are provided for women. Um, but I think that the US side does a better job of um, empowering women's choice in reproductive health. Thank you. I hope that uh, your answer really, uh, the one who sent the question really got the answer clearly. Thank you. Yeah, so before ending uh, our session today, I'm, yeah, again, and also would like to inform to all participants today that CKA is organizing another public online public presentation on 22nd. And you will find out of uh, what is the topic gonna be, but it would be at the same time on our announcement, which is gonna be really soon next week. And I hope to see all of you. And last but not least, COVID is still not yet over and it's still like the 
problem for globally so that I hope everyone gonna really take more caution wear are mask everywhere you go about the crowded place and wash your hand often and I wish all of you have a wonderful weekend and stay safe and take care thank you bye bye thank you very much very much bye bye